the line of work that I am mostly connected to is the recovery group of people, people who are in recovery or in addiction. That is my history and that is my passion and that is my, I probably feel is my purpose is to bring hope and light into that field because that's what was that field, drugs and alcohol destroyed my life. So I have a lot of conversations about drug and alcohol use, abuse, and a lot of um, people willfully choosing deception because they say things like, I was a heroin addict, so meth was not my problem, or alcohol was not my problem, so I don't have a problem with those things, where the insanity of those conversations is just mind-boggling, that people separate it out by which substance, and they don't realize that as a whole, it's all condemned by God in that sense. So it doesn't even matter which one you're saying is safe for you. That's a complete um, secular and worldly viewpoint not aligned or even in the ballpark of Christianity. It is completely living according to the world standard. So the Bible I'm, is my only source of truth so i'm going to address drug use drug abuse alcohol use alcohol abuse from what the bible says and according to the bible drug you drug use in the sense of using drugs to get high the way that a lot of us did that we became addicted is sorcery that is what is sorcery in the bible and if not repented of, sorcery is one of the, on the list that God said you will not go to heaven. If you persist in that as a lifestyle, you have one option at the end, and that is eternal hellfire for those who choose to keep it in their lives. So it would be to the best interest of anyone who wants to go to heaven to seek freedom from using drugs for any reason except medication and remember that God reads our minds and our intentions and our motives. So as much as you want to tweak that for me to think that you really need Adderall for your ADHD, God is the one who will actually tell you if you need it or not. And I'm personally not willing to take risks. I took too many already. Saying you love Jesus is not going to help you on Judgment Day if you choose to keep recreational drug and alcohol use in your life because he paid with his life so that we could be free of this wicked bondage. He has done everything to free us if we are going to continue to do it for pleasure then it's a choice and this might be the last warning you get so i would not take this lightly i would be very careful going forward because knowing the truth we are held accountable to pharmakia in the bible it's a greek word it appears in galatians 5 20 revelation 8 23 and the same root word word appears in Revelation 9.21, Revelation 21.8, Revelation 22.15. And the word translated into English is sorcery, witchcraft or sorcerer. And ancient Greek uses the word pharmakia closely to reflect the modern English word for drugs. The same Greek root word that produces the words pharmacy and pharmacist and the word sorcery used today often will imply supernatural power and spells, but the Bible speaks of something different. And in the Bible, pharmakia implies a variety of forms of drug abuse, including drug use in pagan worship, drug addiction, or drugs used to manipulate and control others. Sorcery. That's what the Bible calls it. 
And so for all the people who say there's nothing about drug use in the Bible, there is. It's condemned and it's under the word pharmakia, which is sorcery. So where you see sorcery condemned in the Bible, that's where it's found. In English, different words are used to differentiate between medicines, chemicals, and illicit drugs. And a pharmacist and a drug dealer both distribute different kinds of drugs and for very different reasons. But they're both drug distributors. In ancient Greek, they used words like pharmakia to refer to everything from medicine to psychoactives to poison. And this makes cultural and biblical definitions critical when interpreting any language around pharmakia. Ancient cultures were very much into mind altering chemicals, much like today. So for people who say this is a new thing or this is a, something that they didn't have back in the Bible days, that is not true. They did. Archaeologists often find opium, hemp and other substances in discoveries. And these substances were not definitely not as strong as the modern drugs can be, but they still were able to have a powerful impact. The development of synthetics is what has really changed this area of potency in a huge way. And that is getting worse by the day, actually. Mood altering substances were also used in ancient religious practices. Temples would use mind altering drugs in fortune telling and oracles, and they would actually vape different mixtures for precise effects. So vaping is not a new thing either. They did inhaling back then. And these practices were part of pagan idolatry. Substances that alter a person's perceptions can be used as legitimate medicines, according to 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, but they can also be abused when used for pleasure. And they can also be used to take advantage of others in a predatory way. And that's a very common thing, um, especially now in the use of GHB and other drugs that completely render a person powerless, easily to be victimized. The biblical definition of sorcery appears to focus on this area of drug abuse, where it's predatory or it's used for pleasure. A biblical sorcerer is essentially a drug dealer or someone who puts drugs into a woman's drink to take advantage of her. That's what a sorcerer the type of person they're speaking of when they speak of a sorcerer. And the list of works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 to 21 appears to be a group of similar offenses all put together. And Paul begins with sexual sin, then idolatry, then sorcery, pharmakia is a word that was used, and then division, then drunkenness and debauchery, and pharmakia is grouped closer to idolatry and sexuality than it is to drunkenness, which alludes to the use of illicit drugs in ungodly ways. John's references might be connected to pagan worship. Revelation 9.21 comes immediately after condemnation of idolatry. And this verse also is mentioned alongside, alongside murder and sexual sin. Revelation 18.23 is part of the condemnation of Babylon, referring to its deception. And I want to say that deception in many cases around this area is very willful. Um, the lines that people who are, um, I don't know if they're addicted or not, some of them just are, they use drugs and alcohol for pleasure, but the things that they will say to justify those decisions, especially when it starts getting into the realm of addiction. I put a post about this the other night about the people who are using the edibles that you can buy in a tobacco shop and other substances that you can buy in a tobacco shop that definitely produce a lot of the same effects of heroin or methamphetamine and they're insisting that they're sober because they aren't using illegal drugs, but the way that they act is definite proof that they have chosen deception because even they know it's impacting them or they wouldn't take it. So deception is a choice that a person makes 
every time they make an excuse or they defend or justify their behavior, that is a choice to be deceived, to practice deception, and it's intentional. It's not blind. I rarely see someone completely blind in this area. If they are, I would say they're disabled in their thinking in some serious way. And it could happen with a traumatic brain injury or severe mental health of another kind. But most people are so bright out in this field that they know exactly what they're doing with these different chemicals. There is no indication in the Bible that the word pharmakia is referencing supernatural power. Combining all references, the exact meaning of pharmakia isn't crystal clear, but it isn't hidden neither. Instead, biblical sorcery appears to be all about abusing drugs for idolatry and recreation. And the New American Galatians commentary explains, in Greek, pharmakia referred to the use of drugs, whether for medicinal or more sinister purposes, such as poisoning. In the New Testament, however, it is invariably associated with the occult, both here in Galatians and in Revelation, where it occurs twice. English translations usually render pharmakia as witchcraft or sorcery. These words correctly convey the idea of black magic and demonic control, but they miss the more basic meaning of drug use. In New Testament times, pharmakia is in fact denoted the use of drugs with occult properties for a variety of purposes, including especially abortion. The Jewish mindset found in 1st Enoch 7.1, a book that was removed from the Bible around the 4th century, they write of the rebellious sons of God who took up human wives in Genesis 6 that taught humans charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And this popular Jewish book, which the Bible even references at times, gives insight into their belief that drug use and sorcery were taught to man by fallen, wicked angels. They weren't intended to be part of our knowledge here. Drugs have scientific effects, no one can deny that, and taking drugs does not guarantee that you will have a demonic experience either. All drugs are not bad. But there's a connection between drug use and spiritual engagement that is evidenced by the fruit of the resulting conduct of who took the drugs. And legal or not, those who claim Jesus Christ, that they are followers of Jesus, must stay away from all recreational drug use and for many good reasons. A big one is they're a gateway to other drugs and drug use in the Bible is a forbidden work of the enemy. Recreational drug use is clearly forbidden to us and without being told, we already know this. And most of those of us who fell into this know that the sexual door opens much, much easier with that. A lot of doors open much easier with the use of alcohol or drugs in a recreational way, which is why it's forbidden. Other than this, the Bible says very little concerning drugs. The subject of wine or alcohol, that's a very different issue. The Bible has a lot to say about wine and alcohol. The effects of drugs on the body and mind are similar to that of alcohol, so many of the same warnings that are given about alcohol will apply to drug use simply because they're used, they're chemicals used to alter our reality. So the concept of what's given about alcohol, the warnings, apply to how people misuse drugs. Some exceptions are the Bible does not forbid using wine or alcohol. It does forbid drunkenness and the use of drink that is designed to make one drunk. So if the, if the alcohol is designed to make one drunk, that is something forbidden. Jesus drank wine and Paul recommended that Timothy drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. But there are more verses in the Bible condemning the use of alcoholic beverages 
than will be found on the subjects of lying, adultery, swearing, cheating, hypocrisy, pride, and even blasphemy. That should concern people. That you're messing with an area that God has very, very clearly shown his disapproval of except for the occasions for medical use. And I am not one who ever stands in the way of a proper use of alcohol or even THC. I believe that there is an appropriate reason for them to be used. But most people who argue, that is not at all the reason that they're arguing. Genesis 9:20 20 through 26, it speaks of Noah becoming drunk and shaming himself, shaming his family, and the result was immorality and a lot of trouble in his family. Genesis 19, 30 through 38, Lot was so drunk, he did not know what he was doing, and this led to severe immorality in his life. Leviticus 10, 9 through 11, Jesus, God commanded the priests not to drink so that they could tell the difference between the holy and the unholy. And I would say that is a number one reason to not drink at all. And I don't condemn anyone for drinking, but I was someone who was a chronic alcoholic and a whole bunch of religious people around me were insisting that I needed to stop drinking but they were drinking, but they claimed they could handle their drinking. They weren't an alcoholic like me. That made me so resentful because you're condemning the person who's so sick. You're claiming that this loaded gun that I have to my head, you can carry it in your hand loaded and it's not harmful for you. But because I'm, I got mine pointed at my head, therefore I need to not have a gun. And I always told them that. I don't understand people who are sitting here trying to tell me what's wrong with me as they're doing the very same thing that they're condemning for me to do. It is so confusing for people who are stuck for people to do that, to be doing the very same thing and yet justifying it yourself. It angers the people that are hearing you reference God for one, it makes us not want him. So if you're in, in any way invested in kingdom building and me coming from severe chronic addiction and having worked 30 years with those who do, I would lay down the alcohol because if there's anything that I hear more about that's more frustrating and putting God off, it's because of Christians that drink. Another one is pot. Pot's become a very, um, well, legal now. And so it's been in that gradual um, process for a while. But I'm amazed at how many who report to be Jesus followers think that because pot became legal in different forms, let's go do pot because now it's legal now it's not sin and that is so hysterically unbelievably ridiculous thinking i know that they know better because i've asked some of them are you using marijuana because their behavior shows it and they will hesitate and they don't want to come right out with it then they say i have a medical marijuana card even though they smoke marijuana, and we know there's no such thing as a medical marijuana card for smoking marijuana. Either way, people know how to get tricky in the dance around it. They know they shouldn't be doing it the way that they are. The thing is, it, it is such a terrible example for those that are trying to get up. I ran into a young man one time who was in jail, and I'm one that always talks about Jesus, and he was resentful of that. He just shut me right down, and he said, you know what, my youth pastor, he smoked pot. All the time he smoked pot. And I said, is that the only thing you remember about your youth pastor? And he said, yes, he was a pot smoker, which I found it interesting that he let the young people know that, but he did. And they resented God. As a result, this young man was had wanted nothing to do with Jesus because he was given a green light on smoking marijuana from his youth pastor, and he's never really been out of jail since. 
And I tell you, on Judgment Day, every one of us is going to answer for the example that we gave to the weaker and anyone who brings you to the choice of drinking or using drugs is not your friend. I promise you, they were not sent by God to you. I promise you they weren't. They were sent by the enemy to you. Deuteronomy 21.20 refers to a drunken son that is stubborn and rebellious. Deuteronomy 29.5-6 through 6, God gave no grape juice to Israel, nor did they have intoxicating drink in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 32.33, intoxicating wine is like the poison of serpents, a cruel venom of asps. Judges 13.4-7, Samson was to be a Nazarite for life, and his mother was told not to drink wine or strong drink. 1 Samuel 1.14-15, accused Hannah of being drunk when she said she had drank no wine. She was in deep distress, but they accused her of being drunk, which was a very shaming accusation against her by the people. 1 Samuel 25, 32 through 38, Nabal died after a drunken spree. First, or 2 Samuel eleven thirteen, 13, getting Uriah drunk is how David hoped to cover up his sin of adultery with Uriah's wife, and he ended up murdering him because Uriah would not play along with the cover-up. 2 Samuel 13, 28 through 29, Amnon was drunk when he was killed. First Kings 16, the king was drinking himself into drunkenness when he was assassinated. First King 20, 12 through 21, Ben-Hadad and 32 other kings were drinking when they were attacked and defeated by the Israelites. I can tell you from years of working in the jails and the prisons, how many are there as a result of drunkenness or drug abuse? It is most of them. And most of them will refer back to someone they viewed as a respectful adult in their life, parents or ugh, the youth pastor of all people, who showed them that they could still be Christian and they could still do this and their life was destroyed. No one says a little heroin is beneficial no one says that no one says a little meth is beneficial a little cocaine is beneficial no one says that a little heroin is beneficial in the form of some kind of pill oxycodone whatever for severe pain but trying a little even as a legal way to reduce pain has cost thousands their lives and I heard those stories a lot where somebody was going along their life was working great they didn't have addictions they were very responsible then they have a surgery then they get oxycodone Percocet and then the next six months they're out on the street using heroin like everyone else all because of medication that was only intended to keep them from pain I had something done once where they gave me that after a procedure and I told them no I said I'm not even gonna take this because I don't want the risk I know how good this is gonna feel I can't nope keep it I will suffer the pain that's how bad I don't want to go back into addiction and many people will simply say the Bible does not strictly forbid alcohol I always worry about the people that start defending it because they clearly didn't lose everything, including their body functions to alcohol. Because if they had and they lost their mind, they lost their life, they lost everything good they could possibly have to alcohol, they probably wouldn't be such an advocate for it because they would look at the lives of the people that are completely trashed, their families are trashed because of alcohol. Be careful which side of that you're standing on. 
It should be noted that most wine in Jesus' day was lower in alcoholic content than many liquors today. It was different than it is now. And of course, strong drink has been around for quite a while, but the Holy Spirit convicts people about whether or not they should drink alcohol. Trust me, he does. And the Bible does provide a great deal of guidance about excessive drinking or drunkenness. It condemns it. And while fermenting beverages are not overly condemned as sin, and it was necessary at times in the, in the Bible because of the drinking water being dirty, they used that. So it had a reason, and that was because of the state of the water that they had to drink. It was not meant to be consumed in excess, ever. And not only is drunkenness condemned in the Bible, it's associated with other sins of gluttony and lust. And most of us who have had issues with drunkenness know that drunkenness and lust and greed and coveting, and it's like a whole group that go together. And very rarely do you hear of someone who just gets drunk and that's all they do. There's usually more arms and legs to that monster. So leading others to drunkenness and filling oneself with wine instead of the spirit is very disappointing to God. And it will lead you eventually to a lot more sin and a lot of shame. I can't even, I, there's just so many stories of that where people are talking now about, I, I trusted this person, I love this person, I threw all red flags to the wind. Because when you realize that Jesus has taken his hand off you and has walked out of your life, you won't know it at the time because you're under a delusion. But when you realize that you have nothing and that if you died today, you would not meet Jesus in heaven. But most don't realize it until it's too late. Noah abused wine. He got drunk and then he was found naked by his family. Lot's two daughters got him drunk because they knew he wouldn't have sex with them if he was sober. Sodom and Gomorrah had just been burned down, and those two daughters and Lot were the only ones that escaped alive, and they thought they were the only people left in the world. So they wanted children, and they figured, we only have one way to get children. We have to get our dad drunk. Many times today, the Bible like today and it plays out from the beginning the bible associates the use of alcohol with one who fails to make good choices and i look at the last year of the pastors who have been exposed for usually sexual misconduct and how they then blame sleeping meds or they blame some kind of a oops drug problem some medication that when you see those of us who did that see right through that. We know exactly what they're doing because we used to do that too. We can always come up with a reason why I did that thing because I really wouldn't have done that thing. In my right mind, it's not me. It's not me that did it. It's really sad when you see mega church pastors saying the same thing as those of us sitting arrested in a police car. It's really sad when they're brought they bring themselves down to that same mentality. You, it tells you the level of sinning that they are accustomed to. The misuse of drugs has caused the worldwide wreckage of addiction, insanity, suicide, crime, and sexual perversion of every sort. And the amount of money spent to do it and to try to get out of it is astronomical. Paul was clear that those who practice the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. When the Bible says those who practice the works of the flesh and it gives you a list will not inherit the kingdom of God, that means you are not going to heaven if these things are a part of your life. And pharmakia, which is drug abuse, is a sin and like all sin, it will overpower and destroy you. 
It is sorcery and it is a work of the flesh that will cause one to go to hell unless they repent and allow God to separate them completely from this coveted pleasure. Revelation 18.23 says, the, lamp, the light of a lamp will never shine in you again, and the voice of a groom and bride will never be heard in you again. All of this will happen because your merchants were the nobility of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Now, this is coming from Revelation, and if I would have read this four years ago, it would have not impacted me in any way like now so you might want to think about how quickly this became a now word earlier verses before that share the doom of babylon as a great millstone being thrown into the ocean revelation 18 21 its ruin in the end times is going to be total sudden and inescapable and that's the kind of judgment that God's bringing down in the near future to wickedness, starting with the church. He is going to blow up things so fast and so suddenly. But one thing he did before that was warn and warn and warn. And all of us know what a warning from God feels like. That's why we hide things. That's why we hide our behavior, why we lie about our behavior, because we know the warning. And these verses continue to emphasize the total destruction of this city by stating that all the activities will cease. And by the time of the tribulation, the city of Babylon is seen worldwide as a bright shining city. And after its fall, the lights will go out and the lights will never come on again. And the, this verse implies that Babylon was a city of sorcery. The sorcery of end times Babylon will likely include drug making and trafficking. And these illicit drugs made will control and enslave people, making them easier to manipulate. It will be a city of drug addicts and drug dealers, and many of them in high places. But all sorcery will end when God destroys Babylon. And according to Revelation 18.23, when Babylon is permanently destroyed near the end of the tribulation period, never again will the city be illuminated by the light of a lamp, and Babylon will be destroyed for two reasons. The merchants of Babylon will use their financial wealth, now listen carefully to why it's going to be destroyed. The merchants of Babylon will use their financial wealth to advance their power, their interests, and influence over world affairs. That is something we're seeing now. The wealthy will control the medical agenda, which they're obviously doing. At that time, when God tears down Babylon, when he blows it up, they're going to be destroyed. The second reason God will destroy Babylon is because this city will deceive all the nations by her witchcraft. And the Greek word translated as witchcraft is pharmakia, sorcery, drug use, and abuse. Revelation 18.23 foreshadows a global misuse of drugs to bewitch and mislead all nations. And here's a solid example of the book of Revelation playing out today in every one of our lives, something that was unthinkable even three years ago. Witchcraft. And the use of medication. And God is going to judge all of these occult practices because these great merchants of the earth, the wealthy, will enrich themselves even further as they profitably partake in global deception. That's in the book of Revelation, and that is going on right now. The tribulation period is a period of seven years immediately before the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. I don't weigh in on the rapture. I don't have an opinion about the rapture. If it's so muddy, nobody can agree, I'm not even gonna get in that conversation. But what I do know is the second coming of Jesus Christ is not the rapture. It is when Jesus returns to the earth. 
and the seven years of tribulation happen before Jesus returns to the earth in person. He came as a baby and he's going to come on a white horse with a sword the second time. It consists of two consecutive periods of three and a half years and the tribulation period will start when Israel confirms a covenant with the Antichrist. And the Bible shares numerous prophecies for this seven year period. And as Revelation 9.21 and 18.23 show during the tribulation period, pharmakia will be used to deceive all the nations. And we're clearly seeing that stage has been set. And those who practice sorcery will experience a second death and will never enter through the gates of the eternal city. Revelation 21, 8 and 22, 15, meaning those who practice sorcery, that is a misuse of drugs, chemicals, will not go to heaven. It's stated clearly. So why would we risk staying connected to drug use or drunkenness knowing how much God hates this work of the devil and that how many will end up in hell because they will not part with it I am NOT against medication like it says not all medication is wrong but if you are using something to enhance your pleasure in life if you don't want to work through your pain and you just want to take a pill to avoid it I would be very careful to stay out of the bucket of sorcery. I would make sure that if I was using medication of any kind, that I was doing it in a way that glorifies God, honors the kingdom, and keeps me engaged in what God has called me to do. And that it never sets a bad example for others around you. We are not yet in the seven year tribulation, but many present day developments are currently setting that stage. If you look at Disney, TV shows, movies, many books, they're making it an easy work for the world to be deceived by the occult. This, so many are just entranced with vampires, zombies, other paranormal creations. It's so commonplace now to see people dress up as these things. They are against God. God hates death, and he doesn't want us trying to look like death. He hates death. If you are a lover of Jesus, you would never try to look like the price he had to pay so we didn't have to go there. These fascinations with the paranormal are a real strong indicator someone loyalty does not belong to Jesus Christ because if it does you hate what he hates if you are connected to God in the right way you hate what he hates and you certainly don't walk along holding hands with it the impact on others around you we're all missionaries we're all leading people one way or the other you need to look at every way that you conduct yourself and think Am I making Jesus look amazing or am I giving people enough confusion that they can't even tell which side I'm on? I would make very sure which side I'm on at this time because we're in a very short window of peace right now. And I know too many people that are just dabbling and thinking it's okay to just dabble when that's the group God despises the most because they know the truth and yet they still want sin. People will pay far more to stay in a haunted hotel than a regular hotel. They will even pay more for specific rooms that give a greater chance of contact with the paranormal. And it's not uncommon when we're praying for someone, we doing deliverance here, they want freedom from dark spirits. But then the spirits that are showing up entered through horror films, through watching horror films, watching TV shows that, that released, Disney even does this. It could be the TV, it could be games, the theater, videos on phones. And this is happening even to Christians. 
There was a pastor who went to that one movie, Paranormal Experience, and he came out, he said he felt it shoot right into his chest. And he got up and ran out because he knew right away something had come in. And those claiming Christ are at the top of the list for those the devil wants to gain access to. If you look back at um, probably about 30 years ago, there was a whole string of mega pastors that went down on sexual sin. And I remember one of them who had a tremendous influence worldwide. He said that another pastor friend was struggling with pornography and he, he looked at it just to try to see what was the lure. And the next thing he knows, he's down cruising some street, picking up prostitutes, and he got publicly exposed by a um, magazine that was following him, apparently. There's no question in my mind that these men knew Christ. There's also no question in my mind that the devil gained control of them through their fascination with sin. And we have to become so careful in this ministry when we're doing prayer ministry with people because we get a lot of people that say, I want to come in and participate. I want to be part of your prayer team. I want to, I want to come in and learn. But they end up, what well, you can see, first of all, right away, but there's something very wrong. And they will, at times, easily confess that they are fascinated and they want to see demons. They, they simply want to watch demons. They want to communicate with them too. They want to, and, and it's so troubling that many people want into this. But the problem with that is, is that person's in agreement with them because the demons know that they have power over this person and it to totally screws up everything. Nobody gets free. Everybody ends up a mess. And so that's why we don't add people because it's, we've seen too many things happen that way. There's something terribly wrong with wanting to see and engage the one who plans to take you to a terrible death and then to hell for eternity. That you should want to see them, hear them, like it's some kind of a circus show. Something is terribly wrong with you. You do not understand. They killed Jesus. There's just, there's just no way for that to make sense if someone is a lover of Jesus. Why would you want to see them? or risk engaging them just for fun or recreation because your entire family will be at risk of that reckless choice. And I have heard many of those stories where people took this as they did not take it seriously. Their life had doors open and they thought they were gonna be part of somebody's team and then everything gets blown up around them because of it. Cannabis, Ketamine, Kratom, and other soft drugs, as they're called, are becoming very mainstream. And the world is being conditioned to accept what God forbids. And in, case, in the case of all of these widespread soft drugs that you can now buy legally anywhere, and experimental drugs. I know many people who sign up to get paid just to be a, a test person for experimental drugs if you really believe that you are a temple for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit you don't have rights to these choices because what you're making for yourself you're making for him too and so if you're sitting there doing whatever you need to think is Jesus gonna sit here and do this with me or am I living a life that excludes him because he won't be there? He's not going to participate in your occasional sinning that you plan to do. He won't do it. So be very careful what you allow into your body because you're forcing Jesus to do the same thing if you proclaim to be Christian. And if you don't see it that way, you don't belong to him because the truth is, everything you do reflects on him if you're his, because he's with you. 
and you're forcing him to do the same things. So that's why people should take it seriously that when they tell me I'm a Christian, but I'm sexually immoral or I'm, I'm just um, going through this phase right now or um, they have these excuses like it's, it's just this thing, it's my age or it's, but the Bible doesn't support that. The Bible calls it adultery. The Bible calls it, calls it idolatry. And the Bible says God will never leave us. But it's very clear also that we can leave him. So if you decide to serve pleasure and what you like, the experiential side of sin that you want to experience, you are making a choice to leave Jesus. That will have eternal consequences unless you write that decision while you have a chance. And I always tell people, I don't know, it has to be, that must be very good sex to be worth going to hell forever. Plus, you are condemning the person you're with. There is no love in a relationship where there is um, immoral sex going on. It's actual, the opposite of real love, because real love would not put their hands on something that is not theirs and that offends God. So it's the opposite. And I say all this from experience. If you have never put your faith and trust in the one and only Savior, there is only one, make today the day of your salvation because God does not owe us one more chance or one more warning. When we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross so that we could be free from all sin, he was buried and he rose again to pay the penalty for all of our sins so that we could walk free. He's the one who gives eternal life to those who are faithful. And he's the only one that deserves our worship. I will put a prayer in the comments for people who want to repent, but I would not take any risks the way this world is going I would not take any risks. I would not defile one more person. I would get right with God. Precious Lord, you are so that I am saved is a miracle. I I know that I don't deserve to be saved. And I know that anything that comes into my life even it's it's by your hand what you will do for the most reprobate person i don't want any more sin in my life i want you to be exalted and honored and i want everyone to see how amazing you are and how worth following you are. I ask that you forgive us, God, for all of the sin. There is so much sin today in us and all around us. I ask that you strengthen this young generation of kids growing up in all this social media and TV and movies. I don't know how. I don't even know how to talk to parents about the risks, but you, God, you have not lost control of anything. And you know those who would repent and you're making a sweep through to grab everyone before you come back. Help us to help you to get as many into heaven for eternity as possible. Help us to stay focused. I pray for miracles that you would help us to to do our mission well. And I ask that you would use any word I say anywhere at any time that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, bring someone to a deep, deep desire to know you. So I ask that you have your way in everyone who hears this and help them, Jesus, to lay down pleasures that will trip up and snare others.
that we not be the one who causes someone else to fall into hell. So forgive us, God, and help us. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.